Been around? Wow, that went quite quick. Yeah. British accent. Works, it works. So, uh, welcome to Geotech Talks. Uh, good to see everyone here. It's a great crowd. This is Tony. She's going to speak in to you. Um, and so, uh, we hold these about every month. Uh, so, not always in Ann Arbor, sometimes in Austin office, sometimes in our San Mateo office. And we recently had our first one in the London office, which was great. So, we're truly international in our tech talks now. Um, about once a month, as I said, last month was Kelly Shortridge. She gave a, uh, a great talk about how to get into the information security industry. Um, definitely uh, a different, different topic tonight. Most of our talks will often kind of err towards security, given we are a security company, and that's uh, generally how we roll. Um, but we try and get a, a good mixture of talks here, um, and tonight's talk is going to be great. Um, before we kick off into the, uh, into the talks itself, you'll probably notice that uh, Jono hasn't kind of developed uh, a, a, a preference for hipster ink and uh, didn't get a natty accent over the weekend. So I'm Rich Smith. I'm the director of research and development here um, and uh, work in Duo Labs. And so before we kick off for the talk, uh, local announcements. Anybody got anything that they want to kind of shout out in the Ann Arbor area? Gentlemen there. Well, it's not Ann Arbor. It's in uh, Sterling Heights. Society of Automotive Engineers is having a... Uh, a cybersecurity technical meeting on January 25th. There is a fee for non-SAE members. You can find about it at sae-detroit.org, and uh, it, so it's, it's an evening presentation. Um, one of the speakers, William White, is the principal architect for the PKI for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, ESRC. So uh, he'll be uh, he's one of the speakers and uh, be talking about security for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. Sounds interesting. Any, any other announcements? Any other local announcements? Anyone? Marianne, I know you've got an announcement. And you caught it. Fantastic. <laughs> I did. Yay. Thanks for coming, everybody. I'm a recruiter here at Duo. My name's Marianne Nunninger. Uh, we have over 40 open positions at Duo, uh, various roles, engineering, sales. If anybody wants to have a conversation, with me this evening. I'd love to shake your hand, um, exchange email addresses. Um, if not, check the website. You can um, see if there's a fit for you, and the door's always open for a conversation. So thanks again for coming, and um, hope to talk with you guys soon. Great. Thanks. Any other announcements? Cool. Well, let's kick off with the talk tonight, then. Uh, very great pleasure to introduce Tony. Tony Gidwell, who's here from Threat Connect, quite obviously with the Natty Threat Connect logo across the screen. She's going to talk to us about bears tonight, and in particular, uh, the cozy bears uh, that have been linked with the DNC breach. Um, a lot about the techniques that you've been using to identify um, and do attribution within that. So there's a lot of juicy details here. Obviously, it's one of those stories that's been uh, in the media. It's got a lot, of, uh, a lot of media attention, and it's been a pretty high profile one. I know that you've given this talk a few times already, and you've uh, when we were chatting beforehand, you were saying how um, actually every time that the talk's been given, new information has come up in the interim time. So hadn't given the same talk twice. Every time somebody wants uh, Tony to speak about it again, there's been new information discovered. There's, there's, there's new nuances and aspects to the story. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what the, the latest cut on the data is. And without further ado, let's give Tony a big welcome and listen to what she's got to say. Is my mic working? Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, my name is Tony Gidwani. I am the Director of Research Operations at Threat Connect. Quick show of hands, how many of you have heard of Threat Connect before? All right, well, it was all going to be by the end of the talk. Um, so Threat Connect provides a threat intelligence platform. Uh, and basically, what we allow our users to do is to master their own internal information and complement that with external threat intelligence so that they can defend their enterprises more effectively. Um, in that role, I am the director of our research team. Our research team is, within the company are power users of the platform, so we eat our own cooking. We're in it every day, uh, using it to create threat intelligence. Um, and this presentation is kind of an outgrowth of what Threat Connect did on our summer vacation. Um, you know, we do this work to sort of showcase the power of our platform, to show how threat intelligence can be leveraged, and in this case, because it was a really interesting story uh, that just sort of kept giving. Um, so without further ado, what we're going to talk about today 
uh, is a series of breaches that occurred over the summer uh, targeting the Democratic National Committee and related Democratic Party organizations, and then a corresponding element uh, to leak that information for strategic political purpose. So as we go through this, I want you to think we're, we're constantly going to be talking about sort of a one-two punch, the operations that breached and exfiltrated data, and then the operations to leak that data publicly for political gain. So uh, we're going to start by understanding the basics of the breaches and the advanced persistent threat actors, um, commonly referred to as the bears. There's two threat actors here that we're going to be talking about. Primarily, we'll be talking about Fancy Bear uh, on the left side of the slide here. Um, quick show of hands, how many of you have heard of these threat actors before? Oh, a lot more. Excellent. Um, so these are two Russian advanced persistent threat groups. Um, they've been around for, for years. Um, Fancy Bear here on the left. Uh, also known as SOFACY or APT28. So within the information security community, um, companies have different naming conventions for the same threat actor group, which makes everyone's life more complicated. I apologize for that. I can't fix it. Um, but in this case, we're going to use the Fancy Bear moniker. That's the name that CrowdStrike uses. And we did that because, one, uh, CrowdStrike was the one that really sort of broke this story because they did the incident response on the DNC breach. And two, because it means I get to use a graphic of a bear with a bow tie and a monocle. And you usually don't get to do that in these types of presentations. Um, APT28 is FireEye's name. Sophacy is the malware family that this threat actor was sort of first grouped around. So if you're reading reports, you may, you'll see them referred to uh, by any of these names. Uh, Fancy Bear's been around since 2007, 2008, primarily targeting defense ministries uh, and military-related victims, but traditionally much more active in Europe than in the US. Um, CrowdStrike assesses that Fancy Bear is the GRU, Russia's primary military intelligence organization. Um, the implants that they've used include Sophacy, X-Agent, you can see this here on the slide, and a very heavy reliance of stealing victim credentials by spoofing their web-based email services. So we'll talk about spear phishing a lot throughout this presentation. Uh, on the right is Cozy Bear, uh, a separate Russian threat actor group, uh, sometimes known as Cozy Duke, the Duke family of malware um, used by this actor, or APT29. They have a much more wide-ranging target set traditionally. Uh, in addition to military sensitive targets, they uh, target companies in a number of verticals of strategic interest, including energy, uh, tech, a um, little bit of medical and health. Much more heavy reliance on remote access tools and extensive anti-analysis techniques, um, as opposed to harvesting uh, credentials using the email-based services, they like to use malicious links that then take the victim uh, to a site where malware is dropped. Cozy Bear was linked to intrusions in 2015 into the unclassified networks of the White House, the State Department, and the US Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, so they are they're pretty active uh, against US government targets in particular. And um, both of them were involved in breaching the Democratic National Committee. So this story started for us at Threat Connect the same time that basically everyone else found out about it, on the 14th of June, when the Washington Post reported that the Democratic National Committee had been hacked. Uh, CrowdStrike was called in to do the incident response, and the DNC wanted to go public uh, with the breach and allow CrowdStrike to publish the technical indicators that they found and share that with the broader community. And that really is absolutely essential point to the way that this story unfolded. As you'll see as we sort of progress through the summer and fall, uh, as all of this stolen information started getting dumped all over the internet. If the DNC had not decided to go public with this, the information security community would have had no starting point to digging into this analysis and trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, so CrowdStrike found both of those threat actors, Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear, in the DNC networks. And there was no evidence that the two groups knew that the other was there. Um, this is kind of surprising to um, you know, practitioners in a US intelligence context. You would never see two separate agencies hit the same target and mess up each other's operations. There are incredibly overbearing coordination processes to prevent something like that from happening. But it's actually fairly common with Russian threat actor groups, because there's a much more competitive dynamic uh, within their system than there is in ours. So pertaining to the DNC breach itself, um, Fancy Bear breached the DNC in April of 2016, so shortly before the DNC realized that something was amiss. Um, so we've got some of these custom tools that we talked about a little bit earlier, X-Agent and X-Tunnel. Um, they utilize anti-forensic measures such as periodic log clearing and resetting timestamps of files. 
we think that these were some of the triggers that caused the DNC to realize that something was amiss uh, and to start looking for, you know, calling in CrowdStrike. By contrast, Cozy Bear on the right side of the slide breached the DNC of the summer of 2015. And if you read the CrowdStrike technical analysis, analysis they're, they're almost glowing at sort of the elegance and simplicity with which um, Cozy Bear, you know, established persistence within the DNC network uh, by a very simple one-line code that allowed them to execute a lot of their implants from memory. So much, much quieter um, than what Fancy Bear had done. And so this was really interesting to us. Um, it stands to reason that if they had deconflicted their operations and it had just been Cozy Bear that had breached the DNC, the breach may have gone undetected. Uh, it wasn't until Fancy Bear kind of came charging through the door, breaking all this glass in the china shop, uh, you know, operating with a much noisier set of signatures that the DNC realized that something was wrong. So for me, as you know, we kind of look back over the year, this is really where we stopped talking about Cozy Bear. The rest of this presentation is really about Fancy Bear. And one of the things that gets me, that you know, keeps me up at night, if you will, is we're spending all this time looking at Fancy Bear, but Cozy Bear, who's sneakier and quieter, isn't getting nearly as much attention um, you know, in terms of what they may have been up to in the interim. So that's sort of where the story starts. Meanwhile, uh, this is our research team here at Threat Connect. Um, we do what we do. And uh, we started taking those indicators and looking for other related infrastructure. Um, obviously, this was a big story when it broke. We thought it was pretty interesting. We were not particularly surprised to hear that the Russians had targeted the DNC. Um, as much as we may not like it, political campaigns are a legitimate intelligence target. Uh, foreign countries want to know who the next leader of the free world is going to be, who their influencers are. Um, and, and this has happened before. In 2008, both the Obama and McCain campaigns were targeted uh, by the Chinese. So there's precedence for this. So we started by uploading all those technical indicators into our platform and looking to see what else we can find. Lo and behold, when we looked at one of the IP addresses identified as a command and control node, we found some really, really interesting activity. Uh, show of hands, how many of you are familiar with passive DNS? Okay, so passive DNS is a very powerful tool for a researcher. So companies that assemble this data set basically collect over time resolutions between domains and IPs. So this is a really powerful tool for a researcher because it gives you the ability to take a retrospective look at what's happening across infrastructure. Uh, and for us, it's one of the first places we look to to see if we can spot uh, additional indicators. And lo and behold, we did. Uh, so as we looked at this C2 IP address, we found something that looked like a domain spoof, this misdepartment.com with the T and the R flipped. So we then used researchers' second favorite tool, Google, uh, to see what the MIS department was. And it turns out to be an IT services provider for the DNC and other Democratic Party uh, affiliated campaigns. So now we're pretty sure we're onto something. This is exactly the type of organization you would want to spoof if you're an adversary, right? I mean, call outs to your IT services provider don't look particularly suspicious. Um, so we were pretty excited to find this, that you know, here we have another command and control node, and we'll see what else we can find out about it. So we go back into the platform and we look at the Whois registration information. And we find in this case that this site was not privacy obscured with Whois, and so we were able to see the asset that was used to register the site. It's registered out of Paris, France, by a handle called Frank Merdu at Europe.com. We didn't realize it yet. This was sort of the first uh, you know, diving in point to this. But a tremendous amount of the infrastructure that we uncovered over the you know, next several months was registered by these disposable email addresses at Europe.com or at Mail.com. Those are both free webmail services run by a company called One and One based in Europe. And it's one that these fancy bear actors like to use to set up their infrastructure. So then something really weird happened. So far, we're on solid ground. You know, Russians conducting an espionage campaign targeting uh, the Democrats. And at that point, we presumed the Republicans, and it just hadn't come out yet. Um, and then this guy shows up, Guccifer 2.0. The day after the DNC breach gets reported, a WordPress blog comes up. And several days later, a Twitter handle is created. Like, this is literally the least amount of work you can do to establish a persona on the internet. And he comes out saying that, uh, he was the one that hacked the DNC, not these Russian groups, um, that he's motivated to create a world free from Illuminati, that he's Romanian, 
uh, not Russian, and that he had hacked the DNC in the summer of 2015. And he starts leaking a whole bunch of documents um, on his blog and communicating directly with journalists. We immediately throw a flag on the play here. Um, this seems incredibly suspicious uh, in a couple of ways. The more he talks about the breach, the less plausible it sounds. Um, he claims he conducted the attack by finding a zero-day vulnerability in NGP Van. NGP Van is a niche voter registration and management software used basically by the Democratic Party and Democratic campaigns. So if you are an independent, self-funded hacker and you're going to create a zero-day vulnerability, you are motivated to create a vulnerability that you will be able to exploit for the most money for the most amount of time. This doesn't make sense, right? This is such a niche system has very, very little penetration in terms of who's using it. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it just doesn't add up. Moreover, NGP Van is a multi-tenant cloud solution, so there's no local binary for him to do work his magic on here. Uh, and as a result, it wouldn't have given him the access to the DNC infrastructure to conduct the hack and, and exfiltrate all the data that was stolen. He also claims he compromised the DNC last summer. Uh, and he did that by exploiting a bug that only came into production in December of 2015. Uh, if you were paying very close attention to the Democratic primary at the time, what happened was uh, when the new version was released of NGP Van, um, the bug allowed the Sanders campaign basically to see additional attributes on voters that uh, the Clinton campaign had added. Um, and it caused a huge firestorm, a lot of attention was placed on it, and it was cleaned up very quickly. You know, hence our Chuck Norris meme, only Chuck Norris can exploit a vulnerability that doesn't exist yet. This guy is not Chuck Norris. Uh, in fact, we're pretty sure that he's a committee of, uh, you know, of Russians, because if you read his posts, which you can on his WordPress site, although if you do go through Tor, please, um, it, these statements don't read like they're one person. It's a committee, and you can see a tremendous amount of variation across his early posts and his, even one or two weeks later and the way uh, his arguments are constructed, and the tone that's used in the, in the writing. Um, so none of this is really adding up for us. So is he the hacktivist he claims to be, or a state-sponsored fakedivist? So uh, as I mentioned, a lot of what we saw from Gucci for 2.0 are very atypical hacktivist behaviors, uh, not only in terms of the way he talks about his attack, uh, but hacktivists typically don't stay quiet for very long. And if they're politically motivated, as he claimed to be, they quickly seek publicity. Um, because he was coming in with his mantra, he was a very Sanders-focused uh, supporter. Uh, if this had been the case, if he was an, a hacktivist, if he had breached the DNC in the summer of 2015, the time to affect what, which candidate would have been selected as the nominee was not June of 2016. Uh, so again, that behavior really doesn't add up with what he's claiming to be. So as I mentioned, you know, we have, now we have all these other flags. We have absolutely no backstory on this individual. He, his existence cannot be corroborated uh, in conjunction with any previous activity. He's not known on any of the forums you would have expected um, you know, to see a persona like that operate in. Uh, and then he's interacting with journalists. So there's actually some really interesting you know, non-technical pieces to this. When journalists question him in Romanian, his responses are not native, le uh, native language. Uh, the, the journalists at the motherboard column at Vice did some really great work where they, they did um, you know, analysis of his English sentence construction and concluded that he was not a native Romanian speaker, but much more likely to be a native Russian speaker. Russian and Romanian are part of different language families, Romanian being a romance language, Russian being a Slavic language. So there are actually fairly noticeable differences in the way that a native Romanian or a native Russian speaker would construct sentences in English. So I mentioned he's interacting directly with journalists. And this for us is where the story gets, I think, a little bit more interesting. He's leaking documents directly to journalists, and they are coming to us to help verify whether or not this persona is credible and to make sure that he's not sending them a bunch of malware. And uh, so journalists from The Smoking Gun, from The Hill, from Bocative are sharing the email headers with ThreatConnect uh, so that we can start you know, looking for additional indicators and see if we can figure out who this guy is. Um, he's pushing, he's really hard and pushing aggressively for publication, but a lot of the documents that he's initially dumping were not newsworthy. It, it was very dated material. He was sharing a lot of stuff pertaining to old campaign finance scandals from like 2005 and 2006. 
um, or lists of donors, particularly that were LGBT, um, affiliated with the Democratic Party, so things that are not particularly newsworthy in a U.S. context, um, but you know, feed a, a nice set of propaganda messages at home in Russian media. And so what we were seeing was he would release these documents, not get a tremendous amount of press coverage in the U.S., but every single thing that he would release would be picked up and rebroadcast by RT. Uh, he's also complaining, you know, he tells The Hill in mid-July that the press is forgetting about me, that WikiLeaks is playing for time, and I have some more documents. And so this is one of the reasons why we believe that the Scooter for 2.0 persona was a source of the material that became the huge WikiLeaks dump in late July. So we start looking at these email headers to see what we can see. Specifically, we want to see if we can make an infrastructure link back to Russia. And it turns out we can. We found his VPN. Um, so he is operating off of French infrastructure. His, French, his Twitter handle uh, was registered from an IP address in France, um, which we were able to identify because when you join Twitter, uh, Twitter automatically suggests you know, eight or nine handles for you to follow, so you have some content to, to peruse when you first join. That list is set up based on what IP you registered your account from. So we started to go through to see if we could isolate the IP. We weren't able to get to the exact IP at that point, um, but when we started to register Twitter accounts from different French IP addresses, we got a pretty solid cluster overlap between what uh, Guccifer 2.0 was following and what Twitter was suggesting to us. I'm like, okay, so that's interesting. He's also interacting with journalists using a French AOL account. Now I know what you're thinking. What self-respecting hacker is gonna use an AOL account? And it's true, not just because I can't get my mother to use an AOL account, she won't do that. Uh, but in this case, AOL gives up your authenticating IP address when you log into their services, and it sends it with the email. Now, this is an indicator that no self-respecting hacker would give up. They would know which email services would obscure that type of information and not give us this beautiful indicator of his originating French IP address. So now we're pretty excited about this. This is a fresh lead that we can start to sort of run the traps on and see what else we can find out about it. So we enumerate this IP address using sources like you know, Census and Shodan to see what's on it. We find open SSH and point-to-point -point tunneling. Uh, so we're pretty sure you know, that this is part of proxy infrastructure. Again, not surprising. We would expect him to be using some sort of proxy infrastructure to communicate with the outside world. So the first thing we had to do was double check and make sure that it was not a Tor node, uh, which it was not. And then we started looking around and found that that SSH fingerprint was shared with only six other IP addresses, all of which belong to Elite VPN service, which is a Russia-owned VPN. Um, seems innocuous enough, vpnservice.us. If you went and pulled the current registration record, it would look like it was registered in New York. Uh, but if you keep going back, when we found the original VPN registration records, uh, we found that it was actually registered to um, a Russian, uh, with a Russian email address, which is, here we go, sec.service at mail.ru. Um, all the IPs offered on Elite VPN share that same SSH fingerprint. We actually went and created an account with them to, to test that out and make sure we were right. Guccifer's IP address is not publicly available, uh, but because of the same configuration, it looks like that that's a privately available IP that's cloned from these other offerings that are publicly available. And so I bring this up because, again, we had to go all the way back to 2004 to get to the original registration. Um, there's a lot of lying on the internet, but it's very difficult to lie to the internet. So an adversary has to be perfect all the way through the operation, from the beginning of all the infrastructure that they use all the way to the end, to not leave breadcrumbs like this lying around. And when you think about it that way, I think it helps sort of take the, you know, to demystify a little bit you know, the huge advantage that attackers have. Defenders have advantages here too. Uh, perfection is just as hard for an adversary as it is for a defender. A Couple weeks later, the DCCC gets breached. So this is the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. So the part of the Democratic Party that funds congressional campaigns. Uh, so we start seeing some of the same sorts of trends. We see indicators that are linked to Fancy Bear. Uh, and Guccifer initially said he had nothing to do with it, but several weeks later starts dumping documents from the DCCC. So here we have another spoofed website, actblues.com. So the legitimate donation site is actblue.com. 
Uh, it was registered by Fisterbox at mail.com. So again, we have another one of these one-on-one -on -one free, uh, free email accounts being used to set up this infrastructure. It was registered on 14 June. So the timing here is consistent with an adversary that's been ejected from the DNC networks that is looking to reestablish access to Democratic-related targets. And what got interesting here was that the name servers that were being used to register this infrastructure um, we've seen before. So Fisterbox at mail.com, uh, registered actblues.com via IT itch. So this is a small uh, name server based in Eastern Europe, uh, self-declared bulletproof, 0% compliance rate with law enforcement. And we had actually seen Fisterbox at mail.com before because this address had registered the two domains down here at the bottom, intelsupportcenter.com and intelsupportcenter.net. Initially, these caught our eye because we thought they were impersonating Intel Corporation. Uh, we didn't realize at that point that we were probably looking at more fancy bear infrastructure. We found those uh, by enumerating the domains on this Bitcoin DNS hosting name server. So this, again, small name server, you can pay in Bitcoin, you can register your infrastructure anon anonymously. So as you might expect, when we looked at the domains being hosted on this name server, we just found acres and acres of badness. Um, not all of it APT related, a lot of criminally focused uh, infrastructure, but I don't think we could identify one legitimate domain uh, that was being registered using this particular service. And the reason we got to Bitcoin DNS is because that was the hosting name server that was used for MIS department, the infrastructure that was used in the DNC breach. So then we wanted to see, okay, we've got Fisterbox and Frank Murdu using this Bitcoin DNS server. What are the odds that Frank Murdu is also registering stuff on ITH? And lo and behold, we found one, httpconnexus.com. So now I've got two handles registering only known bad infrastructure using the same two name servers. Um, so this is, you know, again, as we start looking at what else we can go chase down, this is a pretty solid starting point. Let's go see what else is on these name servers, who's registering that infrastructure, and see if we can grow that graph and find new indicators that will give us um, a better understanding of how the adversary is operating and who their next targets might be. Then comes DC leaks. So this was actually a piece that we missed at first. In those early emails going back and forth with journalists, um, Guccifer 2.0, uh, talking with the smoking gun, points him to this site called DC Leaks. And he's trying to get the journalist um, to publish um, on Sarah, uh, I think her name was Sarah Hamilton. So she's the graphic in the, the top center uh, of that chart. The content was password protected. He had the password um, to give to the journalist. And so the journalist start, starts goes, you know, poking around on the site and sees that there's additional password protected content in the top left there. Uh, it says Billy Reinhardt. So, Smoking Gun reaches out to Billy Reinhardt and says, hey, it looks like your emails are dumped all over the site. Like, do you, do you know anything about this? He had absolutely no idea that he had been targeted. Um, and so gave, you know, went and found a copy of the Spearfish message, which we were then able to analyze. So on the site, we had some other notables. DC Leaks first came into prominence by posting the emails of General Philip Breedlove, who is the retired four-star Air Force commander of NATO forces and the most senior US military official at that time with responsibility for Russia. So you can imagine why he would be a very prominent target. Uh, they got his Gmail. Um, Soros is on there. There was a small portfolio of Republican-related content, um, mostly travel schedules and things like that, but only of Republicans who are hawkish on Russia, uh, which happens to be a lot of them, actually. So, um, so you've got a lot of content here on DC Leaks. So what, where did this site come from? Established in April of 2016. So this is the same time frame that Fancy Bear breaches the DNC. Coming across this was a really important uh, development for us and our understanding of what was happening because to me, this means that from the outset, there was always the intent to start leaking some of this information. It wasn't just that they got caught and so they spun up this Gucci for 2.0 persona to you know, be a shiny object and draw attention away from the fact that the Russians had just gotten caught. There was always an intent to do some of this. They claimed to be a new level project initiated by the American hacktivists, uh, registered by another one of these Europe.com email addresses. Uh, the initial name server, and well, maybe probably not current now, but at the time we built the slides, um, we're also hosting other domains associated with Fancy Bear. So again, we're starting to hone in on some of the, you know, 
pieces of infrastructure that's one or two degrees removed from the actual attack to figure out how they operate. Spear phishing. So the way they're getting this content to post on DC leaks is through spear phishing emails. Um, in March, or I'm sorry, in June of 2016, the team at Dell SecureWorks uh, published an assessment talking about a campaign that they had seen going back into the spring uh, of these emails targeting Clinton campaign staff. Um, basically, what they do is these spear phish emails claim to be suspicious login activity. So it appears to the, to the victim as a Google security email. Uh, we saw suspicious activity on your account. Someone just tried to log in from Ukraine. Please verify your credentials. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of ingenious. I mean, these are really convincing looking fakes. You know, so the user clicks the link. Uh, it's pre-populated. They use a base 64 encoded string so that it shows your name and email address. So again, makes it look more convincing to the victim. And they get you to heart, you know, they get your password if you put it in. Um, they use Bitly to shorten the malicious link so you can't see that it's garbage behind there. And uh, basically, when Billy Reinhart went and found the spear phishing email uh, and sent it to us, this attack unfolded exactly the way that Dell SecureWorks had described in that assessment. Um, so Reinhardt is a DNC regional field director. They spoofed his legitimate Google Mail account. Um, it was actually not sent from Google security. It was sent from a Yandex.com email address, Yandex being a Russian webmail provider. Um, looked exactly like the Google security notification. Uh, we were able to see, because they're using Bitly, we went to Bitly to see what the metrics were on that click's usage. So we saw that it had been clicked one time during the uh, attack period takes them to a faux Google, faux Google login page, and basically from that, they were able to exfiltrate his entire mailbox. So, of course, had he had two-factor turned on, this wouldn't have worked. They would have had a password, but they still would not have been able to gain access to his account. Um, unfortunately, lots of people don't like to use two-factor authentication, and so this very simple, straightforward attack method works really, really well. This is the same attack method that they use to get John Podesta's emails. Um, so, on the one hand, you know, this is much less sophisticated than custom malware implants that only, you know, state-backed organizations have the resources to develop, but it is incredibly effective in gaining access to victims and their networks. All right, so the last piece of this, um, this was where things really, really got weird. Um, so now at this point, we are into, we are end of July, early August, so the WikiLeaks dump has happened which also for us was a major um, sort of shift in our understanding of what was playing out here. Now it wasn't just, you know, again, trying to deflect attention or gaining political points where they could by dropping some of this like fringe material that wouldn't be of decision advantage. You know, the dump of, on WikiLeaks right before the, Democratic, the Democrats headed into their convention caused the chairman to resign and, open, or, and exacerbated a split within the Democratic Party between the Sanders and the Clinton camp at a time when the party was supposed to be coming together and pivoting to focus on the general election. Then we get this. We have um, Arizona and Illinois being hit by a combination of open source tools, Acunetics, SQL Injection, and Durbuster, um, to probe and breach, in this case, some of their state election infrastructure. So at Threat Connect, this is the point where I, we felt like the coverage of this subject started to tip into hysteria. Um, you know, throughout all of this, we're talking with a lot of different journalists. We're getting you know a lot of great feedback on the research that we've done, um, and these journalists keep sort of feeding us additional, you know, additional sources of fresh indicators that we can use to go and find um, you know more to the story. Here, though, this is where we started to get like Russians around every corner. Um, you know, and they're, they're, they're trying to de completely derail the election. So what you're looking at here is the diamond model. Quick show of hands, who's familiar with the diamond model? All right. <laughs> so the diamond model is, uh, it's a analytic methodology for conducting intrusion analysis. And what the diamond model posits is that there are four interrelated elements to any intrusion. A horizontal axis here, which are the capabilities that are used in an attack, and then the infrastructure on the right side of the diamond that is used. So this forms sort of your technical axis, and this explains how an attack occurs. And then you've got a vertical axis between the adversary on top and the victim on the bottom. And this tells you why the attack occurred. So the utility of this for a researcher is that it gives you a mechanism to organize your information, see where you have gaps in your understanding of what has occurred, 
um, that you can use that to pivot around and develop this out into a fuller story. This also happens to be the methodology that undergirds our platform. One of our founders is a co-author of the Diamond Model, was developed at the Department of Defense. So we actually use it a lot. Um, and hopefully here you can see why. This is a useful way for us to organize what we knew about the attack and draw out the implications for making an attribution assessment. And the fact of the matter was is that this didn't look like a lot of the, what we had been seeing all summer. We had a much weaker footprint, um, open source tools that were used, so we had no custom Russian uh, APT tools that we could identify. We had infrastructure that was used, a series of IP addresses, six of which were hosted on a Russian-owned hosting service, which is the most tenuous of links that you could make for an attribution assessment. Um, even though the press really latched onto that, like the New York Times went and like interviewed the guy who owns this hosting service, who lives in, in the middle of Siberia, and mostly resells um, you know, hosting space for pornographers. And so here he's got the New York Times knocking down his door saying that his infrastructure is being used to mess with the US election, and what does he think about that? Um, He's this huge anonymous neck tattoo. It's actually a really interesting article. Um, but again, really not a strong link for making an attribution assessment. The weird part, well, at this point, this seems like the weirdest of the weird that we've seen, is this top IP address, the 5.149.249.172. Um, it had previously hosted a Russian criminal forum, uh, but we found over the summer that it had been hosting an entirely full-blown spear phishing campaign. Um, we found a phishing frenzy kit on, you know, buried here, um, and we saw the entire list of victims that they had targeted. And these spear phishing emails look just like these, um, the credential harvesting ones that I showed you earlier. So impersonating Gmail and some other webmail providers, and they were targeting the Turkish ruling AK party, uh, a bunch of Ukrainian par parliamentarians and lawmakers, and then a couple of um, German politicians. But the German politicians, they compromised to then turn around and compromise the Turkish politicians. And so this was really interesting to us because that looks and smells like classic Fancy Bear. The tactic lines up, the victimology lines up. Um, that to us seemed a stronger link to this infrastructure than basically anything else that we had seen looking at these particular attacks. Um, and then of course, shortly, there, shortly thereafter, um, there was a huge WikiLeaks dump of Turkish party emails. Uh, we had at least a seven-person overlap between people whose material was contained in the WikiLeaks dump and that were targeted with the spear phishing campaign. Do we know for sure this is the source of that information? No, but it is certainly noteworthy and a little suspicious. Um, so yeah, so this was the State Board of Election attacks, and this was really, this was really tough for us to sort of wrap our heads around, right? Because at this point, we knew that we had at least two states that had been targeted. We didn't know what the denominator on that was. Was it just these two states? Uh, was it all states? Um, you know, we really weren't sure what was going on. A couple of different hypotheses, um, one being that this activity was uh, outsourced to friendly criminal elements to sort of probe state infrastructure and kind of see uh, what the vulnerabilities were. Um, but honestly, like we really couldn't make a strong attribution assessment on this, which journalists didn't like, but you know, it's our job to represent the evidence responsibly, so that's what we did. All right, um, so let's, let's take a look at all of this together and see what's going on. So starting in the bottom right corner of the slide, you've got the domestic breaches and the international breaches, and these are areas where we've got, you know, pretty high confidence that these threat actors are involved. So you've got the DNC breach, the DCCC breach, the Kucha for 2.0 handle. I uh, really didn't talk about the World Anti-Doping Agency in this presentation. We can at the end if you guys want to. Um, and then the sort of the fake divists or the outlets for getting this information that are related to them. So we've got Gucci for 2.0, we've got DC Leaks, WikiLeaks, which is a really important mouthpiece in terms of the reach that WikiLeaks has, but is not, we don't believe, to be you know, controlled by the Russian government the way that we think Gucci for 2.0 or DC Leaks are you know, fully controlled mouthpieces. And then as you start sort of radiating out, this is where you're getting into, again, the State Board of Election attacks, where you've definitely got weird things happening, but you don't have the level of confidence that these are as tightly related to the stuff that's in the bottom right corner of the slide. So you're radiating farther out and you have less confidence. So 
So just to sum up, so now we've talked about a handful of different breaches, so different ways that infrastructure is used to breach a target and exfiltrate data, and then different ways that that information is then operationalized and put out in the public domain. Um, so we've got fingerprints of known Russian threat actors identified. We've been able to validate those findings and identify additional infrastructure. And overall, we have victims that are consistent with the targeting focus uh, of these threat actors. All right, so what's going on here? The worst case scenario we were concerned was we were seeing a you know, deliberate, protracted effort to interfere with our ability to hold a credible election. And unfortunately, there was precedent for this happening with the Russians. Um, if you follow uh, events in Ukraine in 2014, as the government was going through a very sensitive and politically charged transition, um, a group called Cyber Bear Coot, which we think is another fake divist linked to Fancy Bear, um, hacked the Central Election Commission. So Fancy Bear malware was found on the Central Election Commission servers, um, and basically, five days before the vote uh, was supposed to occur, wiped all of their data. Um, so it would have, if they had not been able to recover from that, it would have nullified the government's ability to hold a credible, timely vote on election day. And then on election day itself, they found malware that changed the results. Uh, and so this story had gotten picked up and broadcast by a Russian media outlet that the far-right neo-Nazi candidate had gained, had won the election with 37% of the vote, when in reality, the guy got like 2% of the vote. Um, and that was really important because in the narrative, the way the conflict was unfolding between Russia and Ukraine, the Russians were portraying um, Ukrainian resistance to Russian aggression as a neo-Nazi movement. So being able to turn around and say that this neo-Nazi candidate had just won the presidency fit beautifully in their narrative, and even though um, you know, the Ukrainian government would have been able to try and walk that back, would have created a huge legitimacy blow to this election. Fortunately, the Ukrainians caught it, so that was not effective, um, but we had here a precedent for really aggressive meddling in the elections of a foreign country. And this was something that our team debated back and forth a lot about in terms of um, how strong of a precedent that should set for what we were looking at in the US case. Um, people who were, you know, who were more scared about this said, look, they've already done it. People who were a little less concerned that this was the outcome was, Ukraine's not the United States. You know, Russian strategic objectives are different in these two countries, as is their ability to implement those um, objectives. I think based on how the election unfolded, we, we avoided the worst case. However, um, there was certainly a lot of damage caused to individual politicians by leaking embarrassing data. You know, we talked about this, you know, this effort and the WikiLeaks dump in July forced Wasserman Schultz to resign. Um, there's a there's a meanness to this, this linking, linking to the next point here, where dumping a large amount of personal data is deemed totally acceptable. Um, so this, is, this isn't just John Podesta's creamy risotto recipe, uh, but what we've seen the Russians do, these same types of tactics that they've used against journalists, um, they dump all sorts of information about the individual, not just stuff that would be relevant to stories they're working on or their sources and methods. You know, there's a meanness here and a deliberate attempt to intimidate people um, in one case, they dumped um, information on a journalist, including his dating and sexual preferences. Um, when the WADA information, the World Anti-Doping Agency uh, information, they were started dumping all sorts of information on athletes and their backgrounds. Um, the whistleblower who blew that scandal up is a Russian runner. Uh, if you guys remember this from the Olympics, right, there was a huge state-sponsored doping scandal with Russia, and Russia was at risk of having all of their athletes banned. Um, so the athlete who was the whistleblower like, has fled the country and is resettled in the U.S. under government protection and moved again after her data was dumped as part of this hack. So again, there's a meanness there that is a little unusual for what we normally see when we're looking at state-backed attacks, right? Like normally a government doing this is doing this for a much more sort of traditional state-on-state -state reason. Um, here the lines are starting to blur with what we have seen unfold in 2016. Something else we were concerned about, you know, the, the intent of this operation at the end of the day was to undermine Americans' faith in our government process and leadership, to just throw sand in the gears by making Americans question the quality of our elected leadership, um, you know, slowing down and creating controversy surrounding the election. And unfortunately, um, I, I feel like we were kind of already headed that way. So, 
I mean, no matter where you fall on the spectrum, I think we can all agree, like, this was a pretty messy, contested election season. And um, the best propaganda messages exploit a seed that your audience is already predisposed to believe. So the fact that, you know, they're using these dumps to uh, you know, portray our leaders as out-of-touch elites, um, these are things, these are, that's fertile ground in the way that this election unfolded already. Uh, and then finally, to reiterate, you know, amplifying these messages through Russian propaganda channels and media for a domestic Russian audience. So at the end of all of this, you know, the Russians can look at, you know, look at what's happening over there. You think democracy is so great, but it's really not. It's full of dirty money. It's contested. It's hijacked by the elites. Do you really, is this what you really want, Russians, to vote for this? Um, so that's a very powerful, you know, stream of information for them to use domestically, regardless of the way uh, it's received by a U.S. audience. How do they do this? So this is what we've been talking about, right? So breaching and leaking, um, operationalizing that exfiltrated data across a range of different outlets. So you've got um, Gucci for 2.0 going to individual reporters, putting stuff on his own website, hosting content through DC leaks. They built a whole bunch of different uh, mechanisms to get this information into the public domain. But to be honest, at the end of the day, where they really scored points was with the stuff that WikiLeaks dropped. So you know, the, the leak that got Wasserman Schultz to resign, Podesta's emails, those were published via WikiLeaks, not these other smaller um, controlled outlets, because WikiLeaks has a much, much broader reach and range than the Scooter for 2.0 persona that didn't exist six months ago. What was interesting to us was this other point that the credibility of the mouthpiece didn't have to be airtight. It was very clear from day one the credibility of these mouthpieces were not airtight. Uh, and very quickly, the information security community and the journalists covering it came to the conclusion that these were mouthpieces for the Russians. That didn't stop these, uh, these guys from publishing. So Gucci for 2.0 was publishing up into the week before the election. Um, that, you know, that kind of made us sad, right? Like, <laughs> we've, we've done our job here, we've, we've done the analysis, we can show the homework, and yet it's, it's not actually stopping them from being able to put content out there. Or people from believing it. Um, so it's, it's part of that, you know, you get to the point where maybe the fact that this is, isn't true uh, doesn't seem to matter anymore. Yep. So. Well, there the facts, although interesting, are irrelevant. Yep. Um, there are also lots of concerns about the data integrity, right? So this is where, you know, the first three dumps that Gucci for 2.0 did, um, we were able to take a look at the metadata around those files. And what we could see was that they had obviously been, been interacted with, um, with some sort of automated process before they had been posted. So all of the file creation and modification dates were after the DNC breach had been publicized. Um, you had obvious mismatches between file names where you would have, you know, a date sequence at the beginning of the file name that did not correlate to any of the file metadata. All the Word documents were um, uploaded in RTF format, which is not something that an organization uses in practice. Um, or or you'd, have, you'd have naming conventions like one, two, three, four, five. Again, not something that an organization is going to use to organize their information. And so this was really concerning that because of this, we couldn't vouch that you know, these files had not been tampered with. And so again, to that point of this information is being picked up and rebroadcast, what's the due diligence in terms of establishing the integrity and the authenticity of that information? Um, and again, there's precedent for this. Cyber Berkut um, has you know, altered documents within the larger load. So one, you know, and think about it, this is brilliant tamper just a couple of lines and a couple of documents, but the rest of the body of the work is mostly legitimate. Now you have a politician who's under attack saying, well, all of this is true except this one thing. Like, that's untenable. Uh, that's a, it's a really hard thing to, to fight back against. And we saw this um, with, with DC leaks. So some of the files that had been posted on DC leaks were spreadsheets of um, Soros Foundation donate, um, organizations. And Cyber Bear Coot, uh, which is based, again, that was the Ukrainian actor, or the, sorry, the Russian actor in Ukraine I was discussing earlier, um, posted some of that same content and altered it to make it look like Alexei Navalny, who's basically the most prominent Russian opposition politician today, was accepting money from the Soros Foundation, which he is not. 
Um, but again, that would have been a wonderfully convenient way to help discredit this opposition politician by making them look like an agent of foreign influence. And finally, we think this activity is likely to continue. Um, you know, we can, I personally don't believe that these efforts were decisive in the US election, but if I'm sitting in Moscow looking at how this unfolded, I see absolutely no reason to stop. This is low cost, it's a great way to pollute the information environment, um, and then just let people sort of run around in circles. Um, and there certainly hasn't been, let's say, the visible pushback that would cause them to think, maybe I shouldn't do this anymore. Really not an uplifting way to end the presentation, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> so what does this all mean? Like we've covered a lot of ground tonight. Um, the big, one of the big takeaways for us was this story really underscores the value of good analytical tradecraft and how important it is as security practitioners. There were so many pitfalls along the way here, um, you know, to, to get egg on your face or to accept the first answer that's receipt you, you find uh, and not really get to the bottom of the issue. We've talked about a number of different types of um, technical analysis and different sources that a researcher can use. Um, and you know, in this case, I'm talking about this in the context, obviously, of this story, but these are tools that we use on a daily basis. Um, so if you are a defender thinking about how to make your security practices more efficient and smarter, integrating these types of data sources are an important contribution to making your people more powerful and able to punch above their weight class. Um, it also helps you develop the picture of adversary TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures. You know, an individual IP address or a domain name is, the, you know, very easy for an adversary to change. You start getting, you know, sort of moving up and getting to the core of how they operate, that's a lot harder for them to change. So, you know, that's where, this is where I was talking about going a couple of steps back, starting to understand things like the name servers they use or the patterns that they use to register an infrastructure. Those are going to be longer lasting than you know, feehan at europe.com um, or fisterbox at mail.com. Um, strategic context, this is another really important piece and I think it's one that um, as technical experts, you know, we, we tend to forget about. You know, it's not really our strong, so we really wanna dig into that malware or we really wanna go hunting for this infrastructure. But that strategic context, that vertical axis of the diamond is a really important part in understanding why these attacks are occurring um, in this case, whether it's against an election campaign or against your, you know, your own organization, um, we see this a lot in terms of you know, companies in similar verticals face similar attack patterns. And that vertical axis helps you understand why if you are a steel company or you have a lot of IP, you know, who might be interested and why and what do they use to get it. Um, I didn't talk so much about structured analytic techniques here. We actually did a full-blown analysis of competing hypotheses when Gucci for 2.0 um, first arrived out of you know, thin air. Um, this is a technique that was developed in, within the intelligence community. Um, it, it's unclassified, though, because it's really about your mental biases and weighing evidence. And so what we did, because you know, at that point, we knew right off the bat that Gucci for 2.0 could not have hacked the DNC to the exclusion of the Russians. But that didn't necessarily mean that he was, he could have been a, a legitimate hacktivist who also hacked the DNC. You know, we could have had three attackers potentially in the network, not just two. And so what we did was we sat down and we laid out all of our evidence sort of for and against, you know, Gucci for 2.0 being a hacktivist or being a fakedivist. Uh, if you're interested in seeing how that works out, it's on our blog, which I think is the next slide. But that's a really powerful tool in sort of checking your biases and being forced to look at the evidence and how it stacks up against these different scenarios. And what you're actually trying to do is disprove a hypothesis. Right? It's easy to identify a lot of evidence that could be supportive of an outcome. If you can disprove one of your hypotheses, that's a much stronger analytical argument that can be made. Uh, sort of the third pillar here from this story um, is information sharing. So for me personally, the fact that we would have run out of gas at about two weeks after this started had it not been for the constant inflow of new information from journalists is really cool. Uh, I came out of government, that's not the way that usually works, you know, based on my experience. So it was really cool here to see that you had a, uh, a symbiotic relationship where we were all able to move the story forward in a responsible way because we were working together. Um, but that's also, I think, a point, again, thinking about how threat intelligence works. The adversaries bank on the fact that we don't share this information, that we hide in our corner when we get attacked, 
And so we are, are not able to draw that broader picture of how the adversary operates. And that's, of course, important because there's a lot more commonality and we could be a lot more effective if we understand that. It gives you a bigger pool of indicators, helps you identify those TTPs. It also allows you to provide indications and warning. Sorry, wow, I was really, uh, I still had my government hat on when I put all these acronyms on here. Um, indications and warning of, of new campaigns. So one of the things that we started to see was that the journalists that we were cooperating with were getting hit with new spear phishing techniques. Um, and so as we started to see that pop up, you know, first time we're like, okay, with journalist A, as soon as journalist B at a totally different publication gets hit with the same thing, now we go back to all of the journalists we're working with and say, look out for this. Um, you know, it's a spear phishing email. It's gonna look like it's coming from one of your family members with a handle that looks close enough that at first glance you probably wouldn't notice it's not their email address and there's a malicious link. Don't click it, give me the raw email so that I can go detonate that link safely and see what we can, we can find out. Uh, but again, that's all a function of us sharing enough information amongst ourselves to be able to identify those patterns. If you're interested in learning more about any of this, all of the pieces of this have been published on at length in our blog, threatconnect.com slash blog. Um, starting from 17 June, rebooting Watergate, which is where we talk about that MIS department site, uh, progressing up through September when we got through the State Board of Election attacks and the spear phishing campaign targeting uh, the Turks and the Ukrainians. Um, there's a lot more technical detail in here than I've gone into today. Um, and again, more of a, a more in-depth focus on how we integrate those different tools or different types of data to, uh, you know, to reach these conclusions. That's all I got. Um, if you're interested in seeing how this stuff works, you can sign up for a free account on Threat Connect and see how that data gets modeled. Um, that's all the information that we've shared here today is available with one of those free accounts. Um, and that's all I've got. And um, none of the news stories I heard gave any details. I'm curious, what if you know, what information was alleged to have been taken other than the roster of electors, which is available by FOIA in every state? Uh, it's not necessarily, it wasn't just the, uh, the roster of electors, it was voter registration information um, of registered voters. And I think it was Illinois where, um, some of that data was, was stolen. Yeah, but that's my confusion because that's public information. Agreed. Yeah, it was oh, not. I'm just curious, yeah. did they get anything non-public? Uh, not, not that we know of. Um, so, and, and you're right, like that was a point where it's like, well, why would they take this? Like, this is basically data you can buy. This is, you know. Yeah, I mean, all the news stories just seem mysteriously short on details for something that anybody could get. Right. Um, I think, so, I mean, and there's a couple of different ways that might have been. Um, I would find it a plausible hypothesis, although I, I'm saying that this is a hypothesis. I, I, I have not seen proof one way or the other on this, that those attacks were sort of like a phase one. Like, let's see what's out there, what's vulnerable, you know, what kind of, what, could sort of map the networks um, as potentially a preparation for something else. And the hope would be, if that was what happened, that the response from the FBI and the concerted focus that those scanning attacks generated would have shut down whatever might have been the follow-on. Other questions? You've got to talk if you choose. <laughs> I don't want to cause an accident. Whatever you do, don't throw it at me. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> Just a quick, you know, you mentioned uh, one of the techniques you used early on was passive DNS. Um, I'm actually not familiar with that since I don't work in security. Um, if you can just give like a, you don't have to go real detailed on it because obviously any of us can go look it up online, but I thought yeah, it'd be kind of interesting if you gave us like the explain it like I'm five type. Version. Sure. Uh, yeah, basically these companies, you know, through a, a series of sensors, collect the resolutions over time between domains and IPs. Um, and so... That for us, you know, because most DNS monitors are showing you how things are resolving right now. 
um, but it's a really powerful tool for a researcher to see retrospectively what has happened between an IP address, what domains it has hosted over time, um, and how that's changed. Because again, to the point that um, changing an IP address or a domain is very, very simple for an attacker. But if that's recorded somewhere, and then you know, for us, um, one of the reasons that this is so powerful is that that data is integrated right away. So we were basically able to identify that with about two clicks that there was a domain here that looked very, very suspicious that was also calling back to this command and control IP address and that we should look here, right? So it's, uh, it's a really powerful tool for sort of separating the signal from the noise and figuring out which rocks you should be turning over. Do you guys host your own, have, do you guys do your own pass at DNS or using other services? We're, yeah, we're using other services. Um, so within the platform, it's uh, Farsight is the data set that we use. We've also uh, worked with Passive Total. Um, so different companies, and so that's the other thing is that, you know, different companies have a different size data set or, or richness to that. Yeah, I was going to say, that could get pretty big. You know? Yes. <laughs> right. So for us, you know, we're really focused on how to um, leverage and integrate that information. So we're not actually hosting that ourselves. Hello. All right. Um, I guess so a comment and a question. The comment I thought was interesting is I remember reading a story at some point uh, saying that... Um, I don't remember, was it Russian embassy? Somebody, somebody in a Russia, Russia basically kind of said, hey, you know, you guys seem to be having some problems. If you want, we can come in under like UN law <laughs> and, and you know, election. ensure you're having a free and safe election. And everyone got very, very angry. And at first, I, I, I remember thinking at the time, like, oh, they're just tweaking our nose at this thing. But the context created by uh, your presentation kind of casts that in a much different light in terms of propaganda. Um, Question-wise, I remember um, as this story was ramping up, or maybe I guess as it was ramped, uh, you know, kind of late election, um, September, uh, I remember Obama made a comment around, like, after it was the, you know, like 17 and, you know, um, government departments have said, this is the Russians, everyone agrees this is the Russians, except Trump, nobody knows why, everyone's upset, you know, that sort of thing. Um, he made a, a reference to something like, like our response will be uh, like swift and unknown or something. It was like, a, it was a thing of saying like, hey, like this isn't free or this isn't like there is, there is retaliation and it will probably happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether that's still there, I don't know. But I, I guess, do you know of any amount of what that means? means, like from a security perspective, like is, I can't imagine America's like the only country that doesn't do anything like this ever, because I mean, I'm sure we kind of do. Um, I'd be shocked if we didn't. Uh, but like, does any of the information to some extent public, not public exactly, but is it known of in the, the intelligence circles? It, so, um, You've actually hit upon a really important issue, which is that the way, you know, these are traditional state activities, right, being conducted through cyber means, right? So the role then of the government is, of the US government here, is to ascertain what the harm is, what tools in their toolkit are best uh, deployed as a response. Um, and that might be something in cyberspace or something not, right? The US government has a whole suite of options available to it that you and I as private citizens do not. Um, but I think one of the big strategic challenges in watching this unfold is everyone's kind of figuring this out as they go. Like it's not well understood, you know, what the consequences are for this type of action. How confident do we have to be in an attribution assessment to enable some sort of decision to be made? Um, and those are problems that are, those are not unique to any, you know, to an administration of either political party, right? This is. Um, this is still very much um, a relatively new domain. And if you look at, so for example, with China, where you had all of this IP theft and US companies basically demanding that the government do something, um, you know, we actually saw pretty substantial decreases um, on some of our rule sets that track Chinese malware after the indictments right, yeah. uh, and after the OPM breach. So, and you know, the, the indictments. sanctions. It or not sanctions exactly, but we definitely, we had, uh, uh, what is it, um, like our embassy was saying like, listen, like this could get financial, we have enough right. that we can kind of cite this as 
you've done wrong, so we're going to yeah. put a constraint on you. Um, and so that's, you know, again, to that point, I I personally, I remember when the um, indictments were levied, thinking, like, there's no way this is actually going to change Chinese behavior. Right. And looking back, it actually it did. Has. It, it yeah. absolutely did. Um, you know, same thing, a lot, there's a lot of attention about did Chinese hacking decrease after the Rose Garden <laughs> agreement between President Obama and Xi Jinping uh, last fall? Um, we did see a decrease, but it actually predated that agreement. It was after the revelation of the OPM breach, um, where I suspect a very, very sharp message was sent to Beijing that this activity was no longer going to be tolerated, or they better and they better knock it off, mm -hmm. um, or at least do less of it. Um, you know that that has caused some change in behavior. Um, so again, you know, this starts to get into really, you know, this is this is we are now at this point outside of the technical realm. This is a geopolitical right. decision. Yeah. Leveraging economic strengths, right. you know, and, and other things that matter to other people. Right. Nobody's really into leveraging military strengths like people used to, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, things, like in a way things can this escalate quickly. Um, and so that's, ac that's absolutely, I think, part of what we've seen unfold here. And again, like the Obama administration had to tread very carefully between pushing back on an effort against the US election mm -hmm or seeing as interfering in the election to the advantage of the Democratic candidate who is being, you right. know, targeted yeah. in these leaks. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's tough. Hard <laughs> that's to walk, especially c considering the tone of the recent election where, right. you know, nobody was exactly shy on accusations. Exactly. So I don't have a great answer to your question, but no, that was a, actually a, nobody does. <laughs> answer to, your, to my question. Thank you. Um, taking it uh, the next step forward, and of course they always say we uh, fight the last war, uh, is there any value in seeing development, or is already exists, services where um, um, fingerprints, um, hashes of, of emails sent can be put in some repository so somebody can prove that an email has been altered, that something's been posted, or researchers can say, uh, without having necessarily go to the original um, um, source, but say, I just got these emails. Are they what was originally this person sent? That's the first one. And, and the other one is that um, uh, it would seem that there should be a, 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 a business model for the ability to, um, I, I just received an email that says that my account has been um, probed or hacked or whatever, so I just sent that email and the service and tells me the integrity of this particular, whether this is a, a, a phishing email or not. That's uh, like the best endorsement for Threat Connect. That's like actually one of the things that we do. <laughs> so you, I mean, that, that is a, a market or your service to, to, yeah. the, to the, uh, the journalists and so forth to provide mm -hmm. those sorts of, uh, of, of defenses. Sure, yeah, it, it is. That's um, you know, being able to ascertain whether these things are, are malicious or suspicious and to do so with automation um, is a really important part of a defender's job. Um, in this case, you know, as this tactic has gotten to be more widely known, like Google has become a lot more proactive in terms of you know, how those emails are treated. And so now a lot of these journalists are getting emails saying, this might be from a nation state, uh, or a nation state might be attempting to hack you. Um, unfortunately, like, they're still working. I'm still getting samples from journalists of that spear phishing tactic as recently as last week. Um, so. They're going to keep doing it as long as people keep clicking on it and giving up their passwords. I, I get them daily, but I, I'm on Linux. I'm with Thunderbird, so it gives me the ability to, uh, to look these things up. And I don't use uh, Gmail or anything like that. I run my own mail server, so it's like uh, off my own little corner. But I see these things all, coming all the time. And they're probably, no, if you, if you have your name anywhere out in the public, mm -hmm. you know, you're, I, I get maybe 50 a day. Yeah, uh, and, you know, and again, as I mentioned in the uh, the case of the the spear phishing kit that we identified, they you know they basically compromised a middleman to make their phishing emails look more credible um, to their ultimate targets. And so you know there's a again it's a it's a simple tactic, um, but an adversary doesn't you know need to use they shouldn't use their most complicated bit of kit if a spear phishing email will get you in through the front door. Cool. Any other qu oh, loads more questions? All right, Lots this one's going to be a trick shot. I'll walk it over. <laughs> Thank you. You talked about the disinformation campaign. There have been several articles talking about Breitbart and Steve Bannon. 
and that he was doing the same thing, but within the U.S. environs, instead of it just being coming from a foreign nation state. I was in the DOD in the late 90s, going back to the other question. Originally, the Russians were saying that they would respond to a cyber attack with a nuclear attack till they realized that attribution usually was questionable and still is questionable, so that wasn't such a great idea. Right. But what I do see is a big disruption in our way of doing things with all the disinformation out there between the lack of credible journalism as newspapers have died out, most of what we see on television now is more info entertainment media as opposed to true news media, and then what's coming out where all these people are believing these horrendous things all over the internet and with Facebook. And I see that being a huge disruptive change in the way that we do things in our environment. We're going to have to get people to understand better. And also, like you talk about the very easy social engineering technologies, those have been around even before the internet was invented. And right. I don't see that going away anytime soon. No, I, I absolutely agree. Um, again, this isn't, this isn't a phenomenon that they've invented. They're exploiting that trend, that trend line uh, you know, to their advantage. Um, and there was, you know, when these, these documents were being leaked, right, there was sort of two schools of thought in terms of, you know, do you care what the provenance is of this information or should you just pay attention to the content? You know, obviously we came down on the side of, yes, you really should care that a foreign government is the one leaking this information. But, you yeah, know, that's me. All right, question at the back. Nice. Mic down. <laughs> you still hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, now these... <clears throat> These threats and our responses to them are being so widely discussed, right? So one, do we spawn copycats by telling them what to do? Secondly, uh, are we telling attackers, how do we find them out? So are we, you know, do they now have a checklist saying what not to do? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, what are we, what's the, what's the intel gain loss ratio there, right? What am I gaining by sharing this information Vice, what am I giving up that an attacker could use to evolve to the next stage? Uh, and that's something that we do consider when, you know, in this case, um, given the scope of what we were seeing and the sensitivity of the US election, we erred on the side of sharing. Um, and that, you know, we, we often believe that that's, that's normally the right answer. You know, as I've said at multiple points here, the adversary actually uh, depends on us not sharing this information um, to stay effective. Um, so I do think, in fact, some of these indicators will start to dry up. I, I would be shocked, like it would be unbelievably sloppy if three months from now I'm still discovering new infrastructure being registered with at Europe.com and at Mail.com email addresses. Um, by the same token, though, despite all the attention on the spear phishing tactic, like they're still using it. Um, so yeah, you know, you're right. Like you are, in some ways, giving away a little bit of information to the attacker about how you did it and forcing the attacker to evolve. Um, but if I force my attacker to evolve and to change their methods, I am slowing them down. Um, even though that makes my job harder the next time to figure out, like we just can't get, keep getting taken to the cleaners by them doing everything that they used to do all the time and not forcing them to change. So I come down pretty, pretty strongly in general on that, that sharing side. Great, okay, one final question. I'm gonna hit someone in the head, so I'm gonna walk it. <laughs> Um, when you were dissecting the um, DNC breach, like, did you take any cues from like, the code quality and the practices in their code that was from like, a Russian um, source and not a US hacktivist? Yeah, uh, excellent question. So um, when CrowdStrike went in to clean up that breach and conduct the incident response, right, they found, um, they found custom Russian malware tools. So these tools are not criminally available on a, on a you know, dark website. Um, we don't see them used in other types of attacks. Where we see them used, they are clearly linked to, you know, to these threat actors. Uh, and you're absolutely right that it is um, qualities and the sophistication of code, the modular nature in which the code is developed, um, things that show that there's probably a, a team or an enterprise behind this, right? This is not um, something that was probably developed by one individual, um, but you know, a much more robust set of processes behind it. And that's a big part of the um, malware reverse engineering that, that gets done in this type of analysis is centered around those types of things. What other artifacts are left in the code that help us um, reach an assessment about where this might be coming from? And sometimes those can be faked. You know, one of the big things that, um, that researchers like to look at over the uh, body of samples, right, is compile times. Uh, can I tell from when these are compiled if there's a consistency in time zone, for example? Uh, that this is always being compiled in the Moscow, St. Petersburg working hours time zone. Um, so, and part of this again comes to the robustness of your base of information. 
on any one sample, that may not be particularly significant, or with any one sample, it could be easily altered. Taken across now several years worth of hundreds of samples, that seems to be a more reliable indicator than it would be you know, taking that whole body of evidence together. knowledge of like the DNC systems beforehand, like how would they have this information? That's another excellent question. So um, this is one of the fundamental differences that we see between uh, APT, advanced persistent threat, usually nation state attacks. Actually, let's, let's stop calling them APT attacks. Nation state attacks and criminal attacks. Um, criminal attacks are a numbers game, right? I'm gonna send this kit this email to a thousand people in the hope that five of you click on it. It's kind of indiscriminate. Wherever I can get email addresses from, you know, I'm playing a numbers game. Um, these nation state attacks are much more deliberate and much more focused. They spend time um, identifying who is part of that organization, uh, doing reconnaissance on the way those networks are configured. So in the case of the DNC attack, um, they deployed uh, they deployed their malware and they established persistence in that network in a way that was highly sensitive to the configuration of that specific network. And so this is the other thing, that these types of attacks are not a smash and grab job. They take an extended period of time because the, the attacker has to get into the network, really understand the layout of the network, where the data is that they want to get and how to get it out, and to do all of that without being undetected. So these are attacks that play out over an extended period of time. They're not a smash and grab job. Um, definitely take a look at the technical analysis that CrowdStrike published, because they, they walked through you know, the specific kit that they found and basically the whole sequence of that attack. Thank you. Awesome. And uh, I, I see Marianne at the back, and I'm going to escalate my privilege and ask one final question. Um, Taking you back to the very, very first slide when you had the, uh, the fancy bear and the, and the cozy bear, mm -hmm. and you said that most of this analysis was around the fancy bear group. Um, what's your belief or you, your thinking around um, why everybody's focus was around fancy bear? Was it to do with the post-exploitation techniques that cozy bear used, that they were memory resident, therefore there was less, less initial indicators to go on? What, what's your take on that? Um, I th I th they were definitely quieter. Um, also. So this is where sort of the, the rougher assessment of which parts of the Russian government might be behind these threat actors starts to come into play. Um, if the assessment is correct that Fancy Bear is GRU, the Military Intelligence Directorate, there's a much more established history of these types of follow-on propaganda efforts. Um, and they almost, because they're trying to achieve some sort of outcome with that propaganda, it is much noisier. They almost don't care whether it's attributed to them. Um, Cozy Bear has been assessed to be part of much more of the traditional Russian intelligence community, like either the FSB or maybe FAPC, um, which is the Russian, you know, Russian equivalent of NSA. Um, that type of actor does not want to be in the news, right? So whether or not, you know, what, what their plan was with what they were gonna do with this data is a huge question mark. We have absolutely no idea. Um, but they are not noisy in the way in their operations and after their operations in the way that Fancy Bear is. They operate fundamentally differently. Great, okay, uh, I think another huge round of applause for, for Tony, that was Question. fantastic. We actually have a question from the YouTube live chat. Oh, okay, I'm, <laughs> I defer. Sure, so um, the question is, is there 100% proof that Russia as a state was behind the DNC hack and a follow-up to that. If so, may we see it? According to WikiLeaks, Russia wasn't involved. So with all due respect, I don't find WikiLeaks to be a credible source for that allegation. <laughs> However, that's a fair question that's being asked. Uh, do you have 100% proof? The answer is no. Um, that's not the way that this field works, unfortunately. That's, um, attribution is an assessment at the end of the day. So what I can say is this. We had custom Russian malware that was found on the DNC networks. Um, we have those findings that were validated by not only the company that conducted the incident response, but their competitors uh, who validated those findings and were able to expand upon them. Um, and you also had you know, the assessment of the United States government and the 17 agencies that comprise the intelligence community that this was a Russian government operation authorized at the highest levels. Um, in terms of can we see it, you know, the file hashes were shared out. Again, that's part of the sort of scientific method within the InfoSec community of being able to validate each other's research. 
this is a skeptical audience. Um, so if the proof isn't there, the InfoSec community is very willing to throw the flag on the play and say that I don't find this analysis to be credible. Um, and that was, by and large, that, that did not happen here. Like I said, those findings were validated and expanded upon by companies that are in direct competition with each other. Um, so that tells you something, or that tells me something at least. Um, but yeah, to that point, is it 100% airtight? Nope, not until I've got you know, a signed order from Vladimir Putin telling a government agency to go do this. Um, but that's not, that burden of proof is not one that is achievable. It's also not one that, um, you know, to the discussion that we had a little bit earlier, the governments have to make decisions about how to weigh this evidence and what decisions they can make on it in the absence of 100% proof. So where is that threshold? How much proof is enough? Um, that's, that's the name of the game. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, stay around for some pizza, for some beers, and um, hope you enjoyed the talk. Yep. Um, please, we've got a whole bunch of T-shirts. If you want to come get a Threat Connect T-shirt, thank you for being a great audience.